So thank you very much, and uh, thank you to all the organizers, some of whom are my students. So it's very nice to see second generation of mathematics coming up here. Okay, so my title today is Zigzag and the Theta Operator. So as I mentioned in my abstract, for some years now I've been looking at the reductions of two-dimensional gal representations attached to modular forms, especially local ones. Um, and there are lots of interesting patterns that are beginning to emerge. Uh, one pattern I've been talking about for about a year is zigzag, which I won't focus on today, but I'll mention it. Um, another pattern that has seems to be lurking in the background is something I want to explain today. Um, if you look at my talks from two or three years ago, you'll see that I conjecture that this pattern should be there, but I didn't know how to prove it. And now, as of about six months to a year ago, there's a sort of a proof of this, so I want to talk about that. It involves the theta operator. Okay, so I'll start really slow. So let's make the following working definition of Galois representation. So a Galois representation for this talk is going to be a continuous homomorphism from some group, G. We'll work in some generality because the groups change a little bit and the rings over which we're working also change a little bit. G, L, and R, where G is a Galois group of some kind. So maybe the Galois group of Q or the Galois group of QP. And I think for simplicity in this talk, I'm going to mostly restrict my local representations to the inertia group of QP, just to avoid some extra data about how Frobenius is acting. And R is a so continuous, so the topological ring. And in this talk, it'll be things like FP, or ZP, ZP, QP, maybe power series rings in one variable over ZP, or maybe some affinoid, but they'll only appear indirectly, <clears throat> or finite extensions of these. So the main example that I want to study today is the Galois representations attached to modular forms. So fix a form, F. I'll use the standard notation, which showed up in Denis Benoit's talk, for instance. All the name and type is chi instead of epsilon. So a primitive cusp form. of weight k greater than 2, any level, uh, character, and attached to this data, there is a Galois representation, Shimura and Eichler and Dmitry Dean, et cetera, and global Galois representation into a piadic field, finite extension of QP, and I'll just write QP bar there. And it has these standard properties. The trace of the Frobenius at L is the Lth Fourier coefficient of the form, et cetera. I'll write those things down. Everybody knows them well. Okay, so back to generalities. Uh, suppose R is a local ring, as it is in these examples. And you have a Galois representation. <clears throat> well, you can also look at the reduction of this representation. Let me call that rho bar. And fortunately, this board is not dry yet. Let me wait a bit. 
So say that rho is a lift or deformation of rho bar. And <clears throat> going the other direction, we say rho bar is the reduction of rho. So deformation has a more technical meaning than just lift. People know what it is here. I just use it loosely here. So in the theory of Galois representations, you often have things in characteristic zero and you want to go mod p. And sometimes you have things in mod p and you want to lift and you want to look at deformations of these things. So I'm not going to concentrate on this. This theory is used in solving many number theory problems. What I want to do today is look at this problem. Okay, so today, let's try here. I want to understand the following question. Taking the Galois representation in our example, what is the reduction of this modular, two-dimensional modular Galois representation when you restrict to the Galois group of QP up to semi-simplification? So this is a representation from the Galois group of QP to GL2 of FP bar. So what is means what here? More precisely, one knows, at least on inertia, that it has a reasonably simple shape on inertia. <clears throat> this representation is basically semi-simplification. Inertia is semi-simple. But it's powers of the mod p cyclotomic character. I won't write zeros when there's nothing in the matrix, it's zeros. Or it is powers of the fundamental character of level two, so omega is the mod p cyclotomic character, omega two is, these notations showed up in Shanley's talk yesterday. And for simplicity, actually if it's literally true as well, on decomposition, this is just the induced representation from the Galois group of QP squared to the Galois group of QP. Okay, so we know this. So more precisely, the question is, which case arises? Hmm? Uh, you can extend this to GQP squared also, because the P squared minus, yeah, the P squared minus first roots of unity are there, so. Yeah, this is the quadratic unramified extension of QP. Because the P squared minus first roots of unity are in the residue field. So which case, yeah, but you can think of all of these as just characters on inertia. So which case occurs? And more precisely, for what values? Of A, B, C. Okay, so this is the question that one wants to study in this talk. So to answer this and to give a little bit of history about it, uh, there's this notion of slope, which is just the p-adic valuation of the p Fourier coefficient. So this form has a Q expansion. And you get taking its periodic valuation, normalized so that the valuation of p is one, you get a rational number, the valuation of this algebraic integer. <coughs> Could be uh, infinity if ap is zero. So we say this v is the slope of f at p. Okay, so in terms of the slope, one can write down what is known.
Maybe I'll do it here since I want to save a table and I want to keep it there maybe. So some history on this problem. This is a classical problem. <clears throat> so this reduction is known in uh, some cases. So the classical, one of the classical things was some work of Deline in slope zero, which I'll write over there in a second. But uh, in positive slope, there's this work of Fontaine and Edith Sylvan. So for small weights. So this is for weights k less than p plus 1. I won't write the answers of what the reduction looks like. It's just omega 2 to the k minus 1, induction of omega 2 to the k minus 1 in these cases. It's a well-known thing. And uh, this was extended by Broglie to weights 2p plus 1. And his answers are a bit more complicated. So this is one sort of type of result in this area. The other is <clears throat> for large slopes. So you can't read this, but it's not really relevant to my talk. It's just some history. So if V is large, it's bigger than the floor of K over 2 minus P, o, P minus 1, there's some work of Berger Li Zhu, which again tells you what the reduction is. So again, induction omega 2 to the k minus 1. And there's a very recent preprint of Bergadol and Levin, which finesses this a little bit. It's 2v, just for the experts. It's on the archive from maybe a few months ago. So again, unfortunately, the initials are very, every one of the subjects seems to have a b. So this Jalni Bhattacharya also. This is a different B, Bergadol and Levin. So they also write down what the reduction is for large slopes. The thing I want to focus on here is small slopes. And now there is a complete answer for up to slope 2. And there's some partial results, maybe a dotted less than sign, up to slope p. I will not talk about things beyond the partial results beyond slope 2. Uh, but I will give you a slight history of what's known up to slope 2, because I want to use that information also as a test case for the theorem. So here is what is known. So some notation, let's fix p bigger than 5 and let r, which is shows up throughout this talk, to be 2 minus the weight. And I'm going to assume that this is congruent to a mod p minus 1, where a is the residue class mod p minus 1. So we'll take the residue classes in this range. Okay. Then. At least on inertia, we have the, the following table. So when the slope is 0, this is Delin, 74, uh, you just get omega to the k minus 1, 1, with zeros here. <clears throat> When the slope is between 0 and 1, but uh, I'll say the but in a second, you get omega 2 to the a plus 1. I'm going to rewrite this k minus 1 as an a plus 1, because that's the congruence class, not p minus 1. So let me write it that way. So this is if A is not 1 when V is a half. So you get the second kind of representations. I sometimes refer to these as the reducible and irreducible cases. 
because on the decomposition group here, on inertia, everything's reducible. But on the Galois group of QP, this is genuinely reducible, and this becomes irreducible. It's an induced representation. P plus 1 does not divide C. becomes irreducible. Okay, so you have this, and uh, in this exception, this is Z to buzzer G, 0, 9, this came up yesterday. And finally, if you're in this exceptional case, of V is equal to half and A is equal to 1, then, surprisingly, you wind up with something reducible. Okay, so, so, so for very small slopes, these are, this is complete information up to slope 1, up to slope strictly less than 1. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a very good question. Yes, uh, very good question. Um, yes, I have assumed here that the central character is trivial. In this table, I'm assuming that the central character is trivial. If it's not trivial, you have to twist by square root of things like that. And I should have also said one more thing. I'm interested in this if P does not divide N. Okay. And let's assume chi is equal to 1 for simplicity. And this is not for simplicity. This is really for, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, there's square roots of chi p and things you have to write everywhere. Um, I will also like to do things up to slope 2. So up to slope 2, this is completely precise. I will only, there, the answers tend to uh, propagate. There are many more complicated answers. I will tell you the generic answer in each case up to slope 2. So in slope 2, I will write up, sorry, up to slope 2. So we start with v equals 1. The analog of equals zero. I'm going to start writing B instead of A for the residue class of R, and you'll see why later. But you can just think of B as A right now. Yeah, right. So this is there's some this is <laughs> this is possible if something happens. I'm giving a so in this case it's always irreducible, but in this case it's possible for this to happen, depending on something which I'm not getting into right now. There's an additional possibility. Um, so you'll object even more to this table because I'm only writing down one of the three or four answers, but I'm trying to write down the generic answer. This is for slope. Did I write buzzer G here? This is also buzzer G. This, this is the, the same authors, but in 2013. This came up in Shangli's talk. This paper was mentioned. The complete description of the reduction in slope one. Uh, if you're if between slope one, if you're in, in the range one to two, but again, we assume that B is not three if there's some exceptional case. V is equal to three half. And you get essentially this as the generic answer. This is a bit, this was done a bit earlier. <clears throat> Sorry? Little p? B. B. I mentioned that just to distinguish um, from the A's here, I'm writing B's. B is basically A. But, but a bit later, I'm going to come back to this table and B will have some meaning. So for now, you can think of a as B, but what I want to do eventually is apply this for one modular form and apply this for another modular form and compare the two. So you can think of just A is equal to B for now. And finally, if, uh, if you're in this exceptional case, if V is three halves and B is three, then, and this will be the last explicit thing I write here for a while, I just want this, these examples up on the board. Um, then you get many answers. There are four answers, but the new answer that's not on the board yet is omega squared, omega squared. 
So this is Vivek's thesis. Vivek Rai is here at the back. There's a paper on the archive about it. Okay, so I want to keep this on the board for a while. Just a flavor to show you that almost that everything is exactly known, even at this bad case of slope 1.5. Beyond slope 2, there are some partial results, but I won't mention them in this talk. So if you stare at this a little bit and try and extract some patterns, one pattern that seems to emerge is that the reductions in slope v plus 1 are related to the reductions in slope v. For example, if you look at the last row of that table, you get some omega omega, or you get omega squared omega squared. So that's just a twist by omega. <laughs> Similarly, over here, though it's not completely apparent, but at least the lower right corner, it looks like you're twisting by omega to get here. Okay, but that B, of course, has some other meaning. And here also, twisting by omega basically adds omega to the P plus one inside, so it might explain in a little bit why this P is coming to the picture. Okay, so remark. It appears, seems that the reductions in slope v plus 1, some of the reductions, because I didn't tell you all of them, seems that some of the reductions in slope v plus 1 are related to the reduction in slope v, but more precisely are twists by omega of the reductions in slope <coughs> v. Okay, this is the heuristic remark right now. We'll make it more precise in a second. The second pattern is this one. So there's a bit of data now about what happens in slope half and three halves and things like that, fractional uh, half integer slopes. They seem to exhibit some special behavior. And the last row, are, seem to be, in fact are, special cases of what I want to call a zigzag conjecture. which says that uh, at the half integer slopes, and I'm including integer slopes when I say half integer, and at some special congruence classes of weights mod p minus uh, one, certain particular things happen. And I would like to write down a picture of what seems to be happening conjecturally. So this is the result. So suppose your weight is sufficiently large, the zigzag seems to fail for small weights. And just to remind you that it's congruent to b, I have a choice of A or B, let me just choose B, uh, mod P minus one. So B is in this range one, two, up to P minus one. And let's assume that B is twice the slope for some half integer slope, right? So when there's a half integer slope and B is twice that slope, this coincides with these numbers, the twice of half is one, the twice, twice double of three halves is three. So in this particular case, the description of the uh, reduced Gal representation, uh, at least on inertia, is given by the following picture. So there seems to be a parameter tau, which I'll define more explicitly in a second, and another parameter t, which again I'll define in a second. 
so that the reduction behaves in the following way. When tau is less than t, you get induction omega 2 to the b plus 1. When tau is between t and t plus 1, you get induction omega 2 to the b plus p, so on and so forth. <coughs> Um, at the reducible cases, uh, sorry, at the in, at these values where tau is equal to t, I haven't defined tau in t yet, but we'll in a second, you get omega b omega, something reducible, omega b minus 1 omega squared, all the way up to, need a bit more space here, You have two, it ends in two ways. You get omega n, it depends on whether b is odd or even. So you either end with omega n, omega n, or omega n plus 1, omega n. This is if b is odd, and this is if b is even, n greater than or equal to 1. And in the odd case, this is the behavior of the reduction from this point onwards. This so is what this table means. From this point to the left, you always get this. And from this point onwards, you always get this. But in the even case, in the even case, you get one last final answer, which is an irreducible answer. Okay. It ends with an irreducible answer, n copies of p minus 1 added to b plus 1. So this is the pattern that seems to be emerging now from looking at some very isolated sporadic examples, which, by the way, took a lot of work. This itself is a 70-page paper on the archive, getting these four answers in the Vick's thesis. But this is the, these are the patterns that are beginning to emerge. And, okay, so what are these parameters where T is the valuation of B minus R, the attic valuation, and tau is another rational number, another valuation. It's the periodic valuation of AP squared. Okay, let me write it down. I was not planning to do this, but since I have space, let me write it. Some binomial coefficients, R minus V minus, R minus V plus. P times AP, so this is another valuation, where B minus V plus are integers, this is the largest, smallest integers, which squeeze, in which V lies in that interval. Okay, so just some explicit binomial coefficients. Okay, so this is one kind of pattern that has been emerging. As I said, I've been talking about this, and there's now some evidence in, towards it in, at slope half, one, and three halves. You can see this omega b over omega, for instance, showing up there. But this is not what I want to focus on so much today. So what I want to talk about is remark one, that the reductions in slope v plus one seem to be re related to the reductions in slope v. So here's a theorem about that. <clears throat> Sorry? I can't hear. What is consecutive? Yes, yes, there's the small, largest, so V is in here, and it's the largest consecutive integers, largest, smallest. And I wrote, wrote open interval so that they don't, they're not actually physically equal to V. So if it's a half integer, it's very clear what V minus and V plus is. If it's an integer, you really have to take the two integers which are not equal to V, with squeeze together and put V in that interval. Okay, so here is the main theorem of the day. So this is joint work with Arvind Kumar, who's also sitting at the back, a postdoc at TIFR. And this paper is also on the archive from two months ago, maybe. So say P is greater than 5, P does not divide N, and F is a modular form, primitive again, of weight K, 
level n and character chi. So, so say that this form has finite slope. Size finite. <clears throat> so the theorem says that if the weight of this form is sufficiently close to zero periodically, so the congruence, so there exists some integer. This is part of the content of the theorem. There is some integer such that if k is sufficiently close to zero periodically, then there is another form G, right, another, okay, let's skip that, another form G of weight L, same level N, same Neben type is chi, of slope V plus one, these are the two most important things on the board, maybe. Everything else is just bookkeeping. Start with the form of slope v, then there's another form of slope v plus 1, such that the mod p, the global Galois representation attached to f, if you twist it by omega, then it's isomorphic to rho g bar. So rho g bar is isomorphic to rho f bar tensor omega. And moreover, the weight L can be, it has to necessarily be, in fact, chosen to be congruent to k plus 2 mod p minus 1. Okay, so let me make some remarks about that, this theorem, without actually writing anything down. So this is a Galois representation attached to a modular form. If you twist it, it's still odd, right, because this was odd. And if this was irreducible, then it's still irreducible. So by Serre's modularity conjecture, of course, you know that there's a form G such that this holds. And that's the theorem of Curry, wanton berger But if you actually look at the form that Serre's conjecture gives, the minimal weight form, sometimes there's no forms of slope V plus 1 there. Okay, so the content of this theorem is that if you look elsewhere, then you will find some form of slope V plus 1 such that this is true. Okay, I'll come back to how that theorem is compatible with this. This is a global result. It's about the global Galois representation on the Galois group of Q. The omega, of course, can be extended to the Galois group of Q. Okay, so let me say a few words about the proof. I wanted this also, but okay. Memorize this. Fortunately, this has to be erased. I'll keep that one. So, some ingredients in the proof. So we already used the word zigzag. The other word in the title was theta. So it's basically the theta operator. And the setup is uh, what are called overconvergent forms, periodic modular forms. Okay, so these were maybe go back to cats, but they were used to great effect by Coleman, and you know, these things live in families, and I'm going to use these families in the proof. So I'll write some notation down, and recall one or two highlights of the theory, and then use them to give a proof. So let SK dagger N chi, I'm going to actually, so these periodic modular forms always have a P in the level, if you work in this area, this is just, obvious to you, but I'm not going to write P in the level. I'll just write N, and so this omega should really be NP. Okay, so omega is the ith power of the bot P cyclotomic character, or the type lift of it. 
So I'll write OC for overconvergent. Forms of weight. These are periodic modular forms. They don't have to have weight greater than or equal to two. They can be any integer. This is very useful in the proof. Tame level is also P in the level, so tame level N. And character, chi omega i from Z mod <coughs> NP star, C star, or maybe some periodic character. Maybe not, let me not specify the uh, torsion thing so that you can make them line anything you want. Uh, the, this is a, a very large space. It's an infinite dimensional space. But if you restrict to these forms of a particular finite slope V, then that's finite dimensional. Uh, subspace of slope, subspace of forms of finite slope V. So V here, there's no notation difference. So this is finite dimensional. And these particular spaces contain the classical modular forms. So when I don't write any dagger up there, it's just classical modular forms. There should be a P here technically again. Again, I'm dropping it. So these are the classical forms. Which we introduced at the beginning. And it's a theorem of Coleman. That equality holds here if the slope is small. So classical forms of slope V, again finite. Equality holds if V is less than K minus one. There are also some forms of slope V equal to K minus one. Classical forms cannot have slope bigger than K minus one, so the usual Hecker polynomial thing. Some of those are classical too, but we don't get into that here. The other thing I need is the theta operator acting on overconvergent forms. So let theta, the usual differential operator, Q D D Q. So on Q expansions, these things have Q expansions, so all these periodic modular forms have Q expansions also. He's a theta operator. So this operator unfortunately destroys overconvergence. So we're working in this world of Coleman to apply theta to an overconvergent form. It may no longer be a sapiatic modular form. It may not no longer be overconvergent. However, so destroys overconvergence. However, if you take the correct power of theta and you take the correct weights, then theta does preserve overconvergence. This is another well-known fact in the theory. If you take the k minus first power of theta, remember we're allowed negative weights, then it takes forms of weight two minus k to, it tends to raise the weight by two, s two and chi omega i. Sorry, k. Yes. Correct, correct. If P, if P is not on the level, you P stabilize, and then you think of this as a periodic model of form. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm dropping the P's from the notation in many places. Every time you see an omega, there's a P hiding in the omega. So 
This operator preserves over convergence. And I will use this in the special case when k is equal to 2. So then we just have the usual theta operator on weight 0 forms to weight 2 forms. Okay. So this is a well-defined map. It takes over-convergent forms of weight 0 to over-convergent forms of weight 2. Okay, the last thing I need is that classical forms of some slope v live in families of overconvergent forms, theorem of Coleman, where each form has the same slope v. So finally, we need one more thing before we do the proof. Uh, P stabilized primitive, I'm dropping some adjectives here. Since people are wondering why P is not in the level, etc. Primitive classical forms live in Hida Coleman families. I'm working more in Coleman setup. Arbitrary slope, finite slope. So maybe I'll say a few words about this also. Families of overconvergent forms. Um, let's see. So, i.e., there exists a rigid space, affinoid. And some kind of ball. So maybe classical forms live in families. So I'll start with F, my usual F, S, K, N, chi, and P stabilize it. So there's some ball, periodic ball, <coughs> some radius of this ball. This is where the MF is showing up in the theorem. It's coming from the fact that periodic families do not exist on all of weight space. They exist on some, some small balls around your particular weight. And a formal Q expansion where your ANs are rigid functions on U. This is some kind of ethanoid algebra. Such that for all weights sufficiently close to K, in other words, in the ball, and all points. eta k from a u to q p bar. Um, when you specialize this q expansion, you get the q expansion of a classical, of a, of a over-convergent form of slope v. Uh, such that uh, eta k applied to f, which is summation eta k a n of s, Q to the n is the Q expansion of an overconvergent form of slope V. Okay, so this is um, no, you in fact not because I'm allowing this Nabin typus to rotate. So that's one reason I was doing this bookkeeping with the omega. I am going to use that in a second. So, so 
such that for all weights k prime, sufficiently close to k, so in, in this ball, in any homomorphism, any point, eta k lying above k. I should have said lying above k. This Q expansion is the Q expansion of a classical form of slope V. Um, moreover, this is a property of these Coleman families. These forms are all congruent modulo P. So one second, let me just finish. Uh, note, FK, let me call this FK prime. FK is just F or the P stabilization of F. And uh, in fact, all the forms FK prime are congruent to FK mod P. So if there were some Gal representations, et cetera, in the picture, then mod P, all the Gal representations attached to each of these forms would be the same. Sorry? Oh, sorry, this is eta k prime. Okay, yes, yeah, sorry, all eta k prime lying above k, f k prime, thank you. f k prime, eta k prime is the Q expansion of classical form of weight k prime. Slope v. Okay, so now I can finally do the proof. The proof of the theorem. Remember, we started with we want to prove that rho f bar tensor omega is equal to rho g bar. This is slope v, and this was slope v plus one. Right? Does there exist such a g? This is what we're trying to prove. So what do we do? We start with our f. I'll, draw, I'll do a proof by picture, and you put it in a Coleman family. P stabilize it, put it in a Coleman family. Okay. Then you go down to the weight zero member of this family. Remember, my, one of my hypotheses was that uh, K was sufficiently close to zero mod a high power of P. So you go to the weight zero member of this family. Just the weight zero member of this family. Now apply the theta operator. And I applied it in the sense that I just erased from weight zero forms to weight two forms. Maybe I should say that F was in S, K, N, chi. And this form, let me carry the bookkeeping of the name and typus, et cetera, around. This is in chi omega to the K. By the way, this form FK prime, maybe I should say this, uh, is actually, I wrote the weight down. It's an SK prime dagger N <coughs> chi omega to the K minus K prime. Okay, I'll use that formula again and again when I'm going to various weights. So if you go to weight zero, K prime is zero, you get this omega to the K here. So this form is some form G2, and it lies in S, sorry, S0, S0, it's SK prime, going to weight zero, lies in S2, N, chi, omega to the K. Everything here has slope V. When you apply the theta operator, the slope goes up by one. This is the key sort of idea. Somehow you want the slope to somehow go up by one. You couldn't apply theta directly here because it destroys overconvergence. It doesn't take classical forms to classical forms. So you have to do this trick of going to weight zero in the Coleman family and applying the theta operator. The slope goes up by one. 
And now you put G2, this may not be a classical form, it's just an overconvergent form, but it also lives in a Coleman family. And you go up, and you get a whole bunch of forms G, GL for L, again, sufficiently close to 2. This part is not needed in the proof. MG, but for a small ball around 2, you have uh, all these classical forms of slope V plus 1, sorry, overconvergent forms of slope V plus 1. And now what we do is we take G to be a member of this family. So take G such that L is large. So if L is large, it will eventually supersede V plus 1, and the form will become classical. That's one of the things that I wrote down, right? If the weight is very large, V plus 1 will be smaller than the weight, and this form will be classical. So that will make it classical. And we also choose L, which is congruent to K plus 2 mod P minus 1. These forms, by the way, they lie in their weight L forms. Dagger, N, again, I'm dropping the P, chi, omega to the, the Neven type is K plus 2 minus L. Just use that formula again. Center your ball around 2. So for example, just to check this is right, when you plug in L equals 2, this will cancel and you'll get this way 2 form. Okay, so you have a whole bunch of these forms. When L is very large, some of these forms are classical, so that's good. We wanted a classical form. And the only thing that remains is there's a P in the level here. So if you choose L to be congruent to K plus 2 mod P minus 1, this power of the Neben type is set P dies. Okay, and you can check that in fact, this P then drops away from the level. If it was a P new form, one knows that the slopes of P new forms are some very concrete formula. So, yeah, so everyone knows that formula, works with modular forms, right? And that formula will not be good if you just take L very large or something like that. Okay, so this condition implies that G has level N, not, not NP. Okay, so this is how those ingredients were used in the proof. Are there any questions about the proof? Yeah. So there's a strong hypothesis in the proof. The hypothesis in the proof is that in the Coleman family, centered at K, the weight zero is a member of that ball in that Coleman family. This, this hypothesis is very strong. I'm assuming this. Without this, you can't start the proof. And yeah, I, yeah, you cannot always force this hypothesis. It's restrictive. But when it's true, you have this form G. Any other questions? OK. Uh, so let me come back to this table now. So what we've done is we've shown that in, under some assumptions, there is a form of slope v plus 1, which is the, whose Galois representation gives the twist of the Galois representation of the slope v form by omega. So the first talk, some color chalk was used. I've never done this. Let me try. Let's twist these by omega. Okay. What happens when you twist these by omega? These are some forms of slope 0, half, whatever, between 0 and 1. So here you'll get something like tensor with omega. You get omega to the a plus 2. And here you'll get omega. Right? Tensor with omega here. You'll get uh, induction. Omega is just uh, omega 2 to the p plus 1. So you can bring it into the induction. And when you do that, you'll get a plus 2 plus p. Right? And over here, of course, you get omega squared, omega squared. Right? Now, if you stare at this and this, they actually are completely compatible because of the condition that the weight L was two more mod P minus one than the weight, than the congruence class of K. L was congruent to K plus two mod P minus one means the B that is on the right hand side is two more than the A. 
So in fact, this is the same. And similarly, the B here is two more than the A, so you get this. And this, of course, is that. So all these sort of results, which were proved using the mod local language correspondence and the periodic local language correspondence and various compatibilities between them, with respect to reduction, individually isolated proof they're all compatible with respect to this theorem. So that's one compatibility I wanted to mention. And the second I wanted to mention, since we mentioned zigzag, was that even zigzag is compatible with the theta operator. When I say theta operator, I mean that theorem. Let's see if I can do this in two minutes. <clears throat> it's going to go a bit fast. So remark one. Uh, results in slope up to two are compatible with that theorem. Let me write incompatible with the theta operator. And the other remark is that zigzag, which tells you the reductions for some very specific half-integral slopes and for some specific congruence classes that also is compatible with theta. So let me quickly say a few words about this. So remember we had F and we had G. So the data here I'm going to denote by letters without primes on them and I'm going to adorn the corresponding letters with primes there. Instead of A's and B's, I have B's and B primes and things like that. Okay, so let uh, B prime be V plus one. So this is slope B. Maybe I won't write all the notation. This is slope B plus one. Let me call this D prime. Uh, what else? Note that K is congruent to two V plus two, mod P minus one, if and only if L which is the weight of G, is congruent to 2V prime plus 2 mod P minus 1, right? Because the weight L, L and K are just shifted by 2, so we have this. Therefore, and let me assume B is 2V here, B prime is 2V prime, V prime is the congruence class mod P minus 1, Therefore, both rho f bar and rho g bar are described by zigzag. If one is described, the other is described. As usual, I haven't left enough space. So, I'll, let, let me compare uh, these two representations in a special case. So let's assume that t is zero and t prime is zero. These are the valuations of b minus r and b prime minus r. Just some in integers. So most of the time, this is the generic case. p does not divide some random integer. It's for simplicity. And assume, so this is generically true, but this is not, perhaps this is also maybe generically true, but let's assume it, tau, and tau prime, we have these parameters tau and tau prime. So it's assumed tau is minimal, and tau prime is also minimal. Minimal means minimal valuation. So if you remember the formula for tau, which I wrote down there, it was AP squared minus some binomial coefficients P to the B divided by PAP. The slope is V, so you have a 2V on the top, and B is 2V, so you have a 2V on the top, and then in the denominator you had a V plus one. So minimal means this is B minus one, and this is the the <coughs> valuation of tau. So tau was already a valuation, so it's V minus one and V prime minus one. Okay, so with this now we can write down using zigzag what you get here and what you get here, and then you can twist by omega and check if you get the same answer. Okay, so um,
by zigzag, you get induction omega 2 to the, let me write the answer first and show you why it's true, b plus 1 plus n minus 1 copies of p minus 1. This is almost towards the end of zigzag. If b is equal to 2n minus 1, and in the even b case, you get omega to the n plus 1, omega to the n. Okay, why is this one true? This is true because if you look at the slope, it's n minus 3 halves, right? So v is b over 2, which is n minus a half, and therefore v minus 1 is n minus 3 halves. And so if you go to that picture of zigzag, first of all, note that n minus 3 halves is between n minus 1 and n minus 2. So this is like just short of, remember the last thing was t plus n minus 1. I'm assuming t was 0. So it's just short of the last one. And so you don't get n copies of b minus 1. You get n minus 1 copies of b minus 1. Okay, and then in this case, you can do some similar computation and you get this. So if you twist this by omega, you get, I'm almost done, omega 2 to the b plus 3. Now you bring a p plus 1 inside, the plus 2 I put there with the 3 and one copy of p minus 1 I put here. n p minus 1, and here you'll get omega to the n plus 2, omega to the n plus 1. You twist that representation by omega and you'll get this. And you can see that these are basically the next answers in this, and this is exactly what you'll get if the slope goes up by 1, because tau, this tau prime went up by 1, so zigzag also just shifts by 1, and these answers is what you'll get. You just apply zigzag again. Okay. So that fairly complicated pattern, zigzag, which seems to look like it has nothing to do with the theta operator, is also compatible with the theta operator. Thank you. Thank you.